scorn, scorn, scorn. There's nothing quite like kicking off the Six Nations with an extremely painful defeat. You spend months looking forward, then Saturday rolls around, and you spend a full 78 minutes wishing we never hit the fantasy team deadline and stayed in. It's almost here, it's almost here, hype forever. As a Welsh fan, losing to Ireland feels much how I'd imagine losing to your brother on Mario Kart. You can wipe off a win against an online stranger for a Japanese name, but it's considerably harder when they're so close to home. And inversely, if I put myself in an Irish fan's shoes for once, I would spend all the moments I'm not needling blue squidge for being so biased against us. Not basking, but being immensely satisfied that nature is working as it should and their little brother has been put in his place. So, how did Ireland red shell Wales into their worst performance since the last time they played Ireland in Dublin, which was the worst performance since the time before that, that they played Ireland in Dublin, which was the worst performance before the time they last they played Ireland in, in, in Dublin? There's a pattern emerging here. And how important were the green shells that Wales sent right back in their own face? And fittingly, Ireland started the game like they just downed a full pack of super mushrooms in a potent first 10 minutes where 10 points were scored despite more time being spent waiting for journalism sex curtain to kick than watching actual ball in play action. And after Aaron Wainwright's centre-back flashback gave Ireland an attacking lineup, Japanese sex cock side were not gonna let up, unleashing a pre-planned two-phase move. So Ireland form a maul here. Ellis Jenkins prepares to defend a breakaway and Ireland wait for Wales to set their counter maul. The split second they have, the forwards are committed, Josh van der Fleer breaks off and runs so far sideways you'd think he's headed back back home to Johannesburg. He draws Jenkins out and forces Williams up, leaving Dan Bigger alone opposite Caelan Doris, who's a bigger lad, hitting the pass perfectly. Bigger drops him, but the Welsh pack were in the mall seconds earlier, so the backs are drawn into their usual positions. This makes the line incredibly narrow. There's no kind of usual backs out in their positions. The play is so far going to plan for Ireland, but McNichol makes a pretty smart decision to put pressure on the pass to Hansen or Jorlock Sexfutsal, meaning the ball isn't getting away to Conway on the far extreme outer shot. It's actually extremely similar to another two-phase move that results in an actual try for Andrew Conway, his first of the match. This time, Ireland do maul and they get to about the 15 metre mark before the Adam Beard apocalypse that must come for all mauls occurs. Ireland hit Arky, Wales was expecting a crash ball, but a couple of passes keep Ireland shuffling forwards, but also vitally, they keep Jump Frog Sexock on his feet. Again, Ireland just want to pin the Welsh forwards on this side of the post to free up Conway on the far side. So, as the forwards start folding, Hansen and Arky lead a flash back against the grain and the Welsh pack shuffle back baffled. Keenan and Furlong each commit defenders really well and Sex Mother can fling it over the top like a Hermes delivery driver for Conway to check his man and score. It's a really good finish. Really, really excellent finish by Conway. However, the similar two-phase move back in the first half didn't work out, so Ireland load the short side instead with attackers, and Wales drag reinforcements round to that short side. The initial move was stopped, and now this side is covered, so Sex Toboggan now decides to flash left. Him and Hansen don't sprint, they saunter. Creating the extra man inconspicuously, Wales aren't really watching for it, meaning Reese Samit is then caught moments later in no man's land and can only attempt to block the pass to Bundy Aki. He fails, and Aki scores in the corner. It's a really well worked drive, but the most encouraging thing for Ireland is nothing to do with any of the players who actually handle the ball. Across their first six nations under Papa Faz, Ireland attempted similar moves regularly, like all, like properly all the time, trying to change the point of focus with flitting runs and lots of little passes, but the details were wrong and they didn't quite work. If we look at the same minute alone of the same fixture last year, Ireland run a similar play twice. Here they switch blind late, but Henshaw has no runners around him, no options, and he just come forlornly crashed up. He's got nothing else he can really do. And here, Jassid Sexium flashes round and calls it out from his hooker, but Omani's line is terrible and he just gets in the way. He's got no option to kick, the kick's charged down, it's a horrible, horrible occasion. Compare Omani's line to this. The moment Ireland flash round, Keller who runs a great dummy line, but is this by Doris I want you to look at. It isn't just great, it's perfect, and forces Tompkins to step in and cover it, which is what leaves Zamit in no man's land in the first place. The game plan Andy Fowler has deployed has scarcely changed since his first match in charge, like right back two years ago, but it's taken these two years for the players to turn the lines they have to hit from instruction that they've got to remember to instinct. Twelve months ago, if a planned move fell through, Ireland would not have been able to adapt into a new move so expansive so soon afterwards, but now Doris has learned to think in terms of Andy Fowler's attack and hits the line perfectly without prompting, drawing in defenders and allowing these extra passes to actually work, to actually stick, 
and to actually draw in the defenders they're meant to. Last week I described Ireland as being rugby's equivalent of girls allowed, and I think a lot of people viewed that as an insult rather than the greatest compliment anyone could ever pay for a rugby team. Clearly none of you know how much I love girls allowed. The Irish play that looks like flair is rehearsed, manufactured, and orchestrated, just as Girls Aloud produced an almost unparalleled back catalogue of bangers for embracing the machinery of pop music, having dozens and dozens of writers and producers on every single song to click the piece into place with a consistency individuals could never manage. The build-up for Conway's second try is one such example. It's a beautifully rehearsed move, getting as many handlers onto the ball as possible, then running a second rehearsed move seconds later. Plan is, Sex Dragon wraps around, which will make a nice change for him, Burn hits our key, our key hits Sex Jungle, and then they spread it from there. Except, Wales read this and drift to watch the ball out of the back. However, if we rewind, because this comes from a kind of line break, Liam Williams is stood in line with the main line, so Wynne Jones assumes he has a man on his inside, but Williams jogs back into the fullback position. Jones drifts to cover the backs. Sex Chicken and our key. Burns spots the opening and changes the play, putting Van der Fleer through the hole also softly instead of passing to Sex Lung. Island play one fast phase from here, then call rehearse move number three. Bigger reads it and puts the pressure on, trapping Sex Daddy, the man who calls these rehearse plays, on the floor. So Island play a few simple phases with the forwards until he's back on his feet, except they never need to wait. The Welsh defence opens up and Gibson Park can float the ball over the top to make Conway the one to finish it, allowing him to walk it in with the energy of a Cooper Trooper in fourth who ends up crossing the finish line first after the top three are all blown out by the same blue Shell. The system's still not perfect, and Ireland do get caught out a few times, such as here, failing to get any extra runners into the shape two phases in a row, making it really easy for even the Welsh defence to cover. But if I'm an Ireland fan, I find that pretty encouraging. Because if there's still room for improvement, it means we can't be peaking 18 months out from a World Cup. Also, a word for Matt Hansen, by the way, right? Whilst I think his man of the match accolade was perhaps a bit over the top, the addition of an extra handling option coming in from the blindside wing can make so many more of these manufactured moves possible as Ireland go forward into this championship. It's going to open up so many doors for them. His work on the try for Gary Ringrose is excellent, steaming in from the backfield to essentially take out 13 Welsh defenders with a combination of pace and timing. Only Tompkins can adjust from here. Our key then draws McNichol nicely, allowing Ringrose to burst onto the ball. Liam Williams first to make a decision, and Ringrose can glide past him to finish the try. Wales, however, did not have such fluency in attack, with their only points being this hilariously shit score by Tame Basham. The popular point is to suggest when Pivac and Stephen Jones' game plan and philosophy on attack is broken and won't work, but I really don't think that's the case. What we saw on Saturday was the equivalent of someone in Mario Kart who knows all the shortcuts, but is trying to take them without a mushroom or two saved up, and ends up just treading over the grass, moving slower than they would if they just went down the normal path. There were a few passages on Saturday where Wales attack did work where they got through round outside Ireland. The problem was, literally every single time, they slipped up at the breakdown. Now, rugby's an incredibly broad game with so many mad and unexpected aspects that all require insane amounts of attention if you're to compete at the top level. And so it's inevitable that even the best coaches in the world will have some areas of the game that they don't quite understand as well as others. Leicester boss and nose owner Steve Borthwick recently said that until making the jump from forwards coach to head honcho, he'd never really stopped to consider backfield strategy. I'd be confident, for instance, Gregor Townsend doesn't really understand the scrum. Warren Gatland? Attack. Orion Foster? Rugby. I'm convinced, as such, Wayne Pivak doesn't really understand the breakdown. Pivak has devised a game plan that is phenomenal in theory, but it was clearly jumped up without once considering the breakdown. It wants all eight forwards on their feet, with at least five backs up as well. It wants rucks taking around a second, and it wants the opposition to never, ever compete. His approach can work, but it's reliant on Wales getting the clear out on their own ball right every single phase over about six or seven minimum. And in all but about ten passages across his entire era, which is now in its third year, Wales have failed to do this. And once you have extra bodies forced to commit the breakdown, once you have the ball slowed down, once you have opposition players stealing the ball, the whole thing falls apart big time. It's a disproportionate domino effect. To his credit, however, Pivak does seem to know his own weakness. Wales employ a specialist breakdown coach, and to the best of my knowledge, they're the only international team in the world to do so. But the problem on Saturday wasn't the quality of the clear out, but the kind, the sort. Wales' approach at the ruck on Saturday was to blast opposition threats off the ball, to tackle the tackler, as it were, rather than to seal the ruck early and simply secure the ball. Against, say, France, these tactics would probably work, and they can allow for far faster ball when playing against a team like that. But against Ireland, there are tactical miscalculation on par with leaving space around the ruck when you're facing Antoine Dupont. Ireland deployed eight genuine jackal threats, and instead of looking to prevent them competing, Wales aimed to blow them off the ball one at a time once they did attack, invariably just allowing another one to sneak in over the ball and steal it. Here, Basham gets so focused on getting James Ryan out the ruck, he actively opens it up for Andrew Porter to make the steal. Here, Wales get three game line carries 
in a row. It's really good work. But then Beard and Francis are so focused on clearing out Ryan again, they leave Conan to just crack on over the ball and win the turnover. Super simple. Game success is entirely pointless. Or here, in the final play of the game, Lake is twisting tackles out the way and Basham does a horrible job of trying to support and secure the ball. Turnover made. Wales deployed deliberate tactics that played so far into Ireland's hands, they probably qualify as the 0.1% of bacteria Dettol can't destroy. And it left Wales completely unable to attack or even just keep hold of the ball. However, of all the tier one teams, two of the three that these tactics are most likely to work against make up Wales's next two fixtures the jammy little gets, especially with injury to JB Ritchie in the Calcutta Cup match ahead of the Scotland game next week. So, this could become a lose-lose situation, however. Wales either adapt next week and then are less effective as a result against Scotland, or they end up vindicated and don't change how they approach the breakdown ahead of the England game and come unstuck once again. And yet, deliberately playing into the opposition's greatest strength might only be Wayne Pivak's second daftest decision of the day. Josh Adams is one of the best wingers in the world, and wasting that in the centre is insane at the best of times. But it's even worse when you consider the reasons he's one of the best wingers in the world. Adams is in the top three worldwide for chasing box kicks down the tram lines, finishing and poaching chances, and defending the wing. By putting him in the centre, you not only remove almost all of his best attributes, but force him to reconsider everything that's worked for him up until now. The wing is a specialised position and defending it is quite unlike anything else on the field. Yet Adams defended the 13 channel like it's the wing, which doesn't ever work. His body language tells the full story. Everything he does is about trying to force the ball out to the touchline. Shoulders turned almost parallel to tram lines at times. And it makes for easy island ground. And here he fails to jam in, allowing Janice Choplin Sexfern to burst through the inside and find Conway on the outside. On whom, then, Adams misses the tackle moments later. And there were evidently some late pretty excitable meeting going on in the Irish team hotel as the side deployed a set move targeted at the 13 channel off almost every set piece for the first hour. This, for instance, is lovely. Ireland pick up one way, meaning Williams, Wainwright and Jenkins all go that way and leave Adams defending alone in a position he's never really defended before. Adams once again marks the channel as though it was going to be the wing and trusts the inside defence when there essentially isn't any, getting very, very lucky. Basham can knock Ring Rose just slightly off balance. Thankfully, Adams was aided this whole game by an inexplicably phenomenal defensive performance by Nick Tompkins, who I'm pretty sure broke the 139 year record for most tackles by a back in a single 6-5 Home Nations Championship game on Saturday. I know, Nick Tompkins. Here, Adams is essentially operating in no role, but Tompkins' work is Chris Harris-Illian to close it down and prevent a clean break for Ring Rose. Ireland were just smart all game, trying to make Adams make as many decisions as possible. Whilst Ireland do have their own distinctive style, they're just as good as they ever were at tearing into any opposition wounds, turning weaknesses into gaping, bleeding holes in your face. If you give them any chance to dig in, they're gonna get their nails out. It's got to be pretty encouraging if you're Irish. So good, even a really biased Squidge video as ever couldn't bring the mood down ahead of their trip to Paris. Their brother's beaten, and it's time to take on the hipster kid from the year above, knowing if they can beat him on Rainbow Road, they can be king of the school. Wales, meanwhile, now look forward to home ties against Scotland and France, the two top table teams that I think their game plan will be most effective against. Look, I'm not saying that Wales will beat them, but in a game of rock, paper, scissors, where Ireland is scissors, and Wales just got cut to shreds, maybe France are a human man pretty prone to getting paper cuts on their non-dominant hand. I mean, a human would still beat the ever-living shit out of some paper, but the sheep might get a few more blows in than you'd expect, given all logical evidence. Because it never really matters how the Six Nations kicks off, only that it does. It marks the beginning of another seven weeks of this fevered excitement. Excellent rugby almost always coming from at least one team, and so much sparkling stupid hope. And I think I speak for everyone. When I say, crushing defeat or otherwise, I wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. This is week one of the Six Nations. That is game one of 15. 14 more to go. I'm moving on to the Calcutta Cup, which will be next. And also France, Italy this week before obviously getting into next 
Uh, we, there's plenty more to come. Uh, there's a video on why Italy are actually going to be quite good now. And we saw, you know, signs that it might actually be quite good now uh, against France. Um, and loads more happening. There's a podcast as well if you want to look at some old games. Um, it's really good. We talk about um, Wales against Ireland from 1987. And that's a terrible match. It's really bad. Uh, if you want to look at that, that is over on all big podcast providers, as well as, as we say, other videos here on the channel. I'll see you very soon for some Scotland. Bye.